listen to me talk about this little place. Um, my name is Robin Sherman. I am the curator and director of preservation for Castle in the Clouds. Um, and I'm so pleased to be here to talk to you about the long history of this really incredible estate. Now, before I dive in, um, by show of hands, how many of you have visited the castle in the past? <laughs> All right. And how many have toured in the last year or two? Okay. So you may already be familiar with the story of Lucknow and with Tom and Olive Plant, um, but what about the rest of the property? What about its much longer history? We're going to dive into all of that today. So to start our story um, from the beginning, we should really take a minute to talk about the land itself. Did you know that Castle in the Clouds sits on the southern slope of an extinct volcano? <laughs> what we call the Ossipee Mountains today are in fact uh, the remnants of a volcano that probably stood about 10,000 feet. Um, to put that into perspective, uh, Mount Washington is just under 6,300 feet and Mount Shaw, which is the largest or the tallest of the Ossipee Range is just about 3,000 feet. Now this volcano had three major eruptions, the first of which took place about 100 million years ago. About 10 million years after that, um, the second eruption took place. In this eruption, the magma chamber actually collapsed. So the rock that was above fell down inside, forced the magma up. It cooled rapidly and formed a feature called a ring dike. The Ossipee Mountain Ring Dike is a nearly complete circle about nine miles in diameter. It happens to be one of the most famous ring dikes in the world, at least to the geologists that study that sort of thing. Now let's jump ahead uh, 90 million years, give or take. <laughs> For thousands of years, the Ossipee Mountains likely served as hunting and foraging land for the indigenous people of this area. This map, which was created by and shows the research of the Indigenous New Hampshire Collaborative Collective, shows the approximate location of 17th century indigenous villages, which are shaded in orange. The White Mountains and Lakes region of New Hampshire were home to the Abenaki people well before white settlers came to the area. The Abenaki people traveled to this region seasonally to hunt and fish. The land we call Moultonboro today was a thriving hub for Native Americans during this period. There was an Indian village, a fort, a trading post in the area. The land where Bald Peak Colony Club sits today was also a well-known campsite for Native Americans. Because these camps were so well situated, close to the lake, with, the, with easy access to really a plethora of natural resources, it seems unlikely that the indigenous people would have climbed into the mountains to make additional campsites. But as I said before, the Ossipee Peaks likely fell within the range of their hunting and foraging land. The variety of wildlife that uh, roams the property even today, deer and bear and the, and the like, would have been an enticing resource. Now imagine the property about 250 years ago. Settlers of European descent first inhabited the southern slope of the Ossipee Mountains shortly after the American Revolution. The Lee family were the first to settle the area. They were joined soon after by the Horn, Witten, Whit Whittam, Roberts, and Kopp families. Other families followed soon after. They built a schoolhouse to educate their children but they would walk to church in Melvin Village each Sunday. When there were too few children to justify maintaining the schoolhouse, lessons were held in the Lee family's front room. This was a tight-knit community. They were known as the Mountain People of Moultonboro, and they took care of each other. These family raised livestock and subsisted off the land, only occasionally making the trip into Laconia for necessary supplies. Later, they benefited from selling their timber, their grain, their livestock, and their produce. Families lived here for generations. 
the cellar holes of those original homesteads and the associated burial plots still dot the landscape, especially along the Lakes Region Conservation Trust's settlement trail. <clears throat> By the latter half of the 19th century, though, descendants of these first families were beginning to move away from their ancestral homes, uh, looking for more lucrative employment, typically. In doing so, they left tracts of land ready for a new owner, and that would come in the form of a man named Benjamin Franklin Shaw. <clears throat> B.F. Shaw was born in 1832 in Monmouth, Maine. He was known as the inventor of the Shaw Knit Stocking Loom and the owner of the Shaw Stocking Company of Lowell, Massachusetts. In 1879, he began purchasing land in the Oski Mountains for a summer estate. Shaw eventually amassed about 350 acres of land on which he built a large home, which he called Bulaka Hall. Oski Mountain Park, as the property came to be known, soon earned a reputation as an idyllic summer retreat. And Shaw eventually opened his doors to paying customers. His summer home transitioned into an active hotel, Bulaka Hall, sometimes called the lodge or park house, could house up to 35 guests. In 1884, Ossipi Mountain Park, billed as the heart of the Ossipis, was open to guests from June 14th to, Ossipi, uh, to October 31st, and rooms could be secured in advance for a week or longer. Guests arriving in Center Harbor made their way to the park by stagecoach. Visitors to Shaw's estate could hike through the mountains or along Shannon Brook to see the seven waterfalls. Wooden bridges named after members of the Shaw family crisscrossed the brook and made attractive backdrops for picnics or the occasional photograph. Visitors also could climb to the peak of Lee Mountain to take in the panoramic view of Lake Winnipesaukee. These treks became so popular that Shaw constructed a viewing platform on the site called the Crow's Nest. And for those park visitors who did not wish to hike to this location, one could pay a small fee and be driven up to the crow's nest <clears throat> via the carriage road. <clears throat> Oski Mountain Park also became a destination for artists and poets. Well before Shaw's hotel opened, the beauty of the natural setting inspired romantic descriptions from well-known poets. In 1849, for instance, John Greenleaf Whittier penned The Lakeside, which seems to have been inspired by the dramatic mountain and lake backdrop um, that you see here. As the poem goes, the shadows round the inland sea are deepening into night. Slow up the slopes of Ossipi, they chase the lessening light. Tired of the long day's blinding heat, I rest my languid eye. Lake of, the, oh, Lake of the hills where cool and sweet thy sunset waters lie. Along the sky in wavy lines o'er isle and reach and bay, green belted with eternal pines, the mountains stretch away. Below the maple masses sleep where shore and water blends, while midway on the tranquil deep the evening light descends. These verses certainly paint a lovely picture of the mountain and lake that we love so much. In 1892, Lucy Larkham toured the region and published an article about her travels in the Oski Glens in New England Magazine, describing the site of Wilaka Hall nestled between scenic points such as Red Hill and the Crow's Nest. She wrote, you gaze and dream with the feeling one might have suspended on the edge of a cloud. There is earth below you and you are of it, but not in it, having risen to the green threshold of a rural heaven. And perhaps unsurprisingly, Robert Frost spent a season in the Oski Mountains as well, although not as a guest of the Shaws. Frost had followed his sweetheart, Eleanor White, to the summer resort and found accommodations in the half dilapidated cottage, which he rented from Henry Horn for a nominal fee and the promise that he, Frost, would guard Horn's cache of hard cider, 
<laughs> Ross spent a great deal of his time exploring the mountains, and his experiences that summer inspired his work even years later. But it was one particularly terrifying night, which he recalled most vividly. According to his own recollections, the cottage Frost rented was abandoned and not in great shape, and it didn't have a lock on the front door. He was spooked one night by a knock on that door, and he invited his surprise visitor in whilst climbing out a window on the opposite side of the building. <laughs> He recalled wandering through the woods for the remainder of the night, finally returning to the cabin in the morning, only to find one of the neighbors passed out drunk on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> if you've ever read or heard Frost's poem, The Lockless Door, this was the event that inspired that, those verses. In 1891, B.F. Shaw passed away, and his daughter Jenny assumed management of the hotel. She sold the park and resort to Mrs. Emma F. Pettengill of New York, a New York investor, in 1899. Pettengill and her sister continued to operate the hotel into the 20th century, eventually turning it into a boarding house until the land and buildings were sold to Thomas Plant. Thomas Plant was born in Bath, Maine in 1859 and raised in a working class family of French Canadian origin. He completed his formal education at age 14 and went to work to help support his family. He worked a variety of jobs before finding an apprenticeship as a shoe laster in a factory in Richmond, Maine. When the factory burned down, Plant moved to Lynn, Massachusetts, arguably the center of the shoemaking industry at that time, and found work with the Keene Brothers Company. Over the course of the next 11 years, Plant rose from being a laborer to owning his own company, the Thomas G. Plant Company, which he established at the age of only 32. By 1910, it was the largest factory in the United States and the largest shoe factory in the world, employing over 5,500 people, <coughs> producing 6 million pairs of shoes annually and bringing in about $8 million worth of revenue each year. Around this time, Plant became an involuntary fixture in the newspapers. He was in the midst of a bitter dispute with the United Shoe Machinery Company. As a little bit of backstory here, United Shoe held a monopoly on um, the production of the machinery that produced shoes. Shoe manufacturers not only had to rent the machinery from United Shoe, they also paid a royalty on each pair of shoes that they produced on those machines. As a shoe factory owner, Plant was frustrated by this arrangement. And he spent a good deal of time and a great deal of money to create his own line of shoe production machinery. This in itself may not have been a huge deal, but when Plant started to try to sell his Wonder Worker shoe line to other manufacturers, United Shoe took serious issue. They sued Plant for patent infringement, and the court battle dragged on for months. Plant also happened to be going through a fairly public divorce from his first wife, Caroline Griggs Plant, at the same time. So when United Shoe eventually made an offer of $6 million in cash and stocks, Plant sold his company and began to plan for his retirement. He was only 51 years old. He was incredibly wealthy. He was suddenly and unexpectedly retired. So he did what you might do. He went in search of a great piece of land for a retirement home. In 1911, Plant was traveling in Europe with his niece Amy, apparently on the hunt for this plot of land on which he could build his new retirement estate. According to family stories, Amy enthralled her uncle with stories of the beautiful land of the Oski Mountains. And based on her description, Plant wired his younger brother William and other agents to begin purchasing plots of land for him. It's very likely that Plant was already aware of this area. Um, William Plant, his younger brother, had a summer home of his own on Tufton Borough Neck, and he had 
very likely visited at some point. In any event, plants agents began accumulating land at a rapid pace, and rumors quickly spread about what plant's purpose was. <laughs> By October, newspapers were uh, running stories about his intentions, and most believed that he was simply a man intent on hoarding some of the most beautiful land in the region for his own, quote unquote, selfish enjoyment. <laughs> <laughs> now, Shaw had maintained amicable relations with his neighbors, uh, the few homesteading families that had remained in Oski Mountain Park during his years there. He had employed Henry Horn as his, um, his property manager, and the Lee family, who had their homestead right across the street from Wheelocka Hall, had kept Wheelocka Hall's kitchens well stocked. Unfortunately, a similar arrangement was not in the cards when Thomas Plant purchased the property. In fact, Plant's interactions with the Lee family earned him a reputation for ruthlessness. The Lees were the last homesteading family, as I said, that remained in the Oski Mountain area, and their tract of 200 acres was all that stood between plant owning from the top of the seven peaks of the Oski Mountains to the shore of Lake Winnipesaukee. Plant reportedly offered them $2,500 for their property. For all of the land Tom purchased, he said that he offered what he felt was fair and what he could afford. But this offer must have felt offensively low for the Lee family, who had turned down an offer of $3,000 from a family member just the previous summer. They refused to sell their land, but Tom refused to give up. In February of 1912, newspapers ran the story of the spite fence on Ossipi Mountain, erected the previous December. The fence, which reportedly stood 20 feet high and ran hundreds of feet, blocked the Lee's view of Lake Winnipesaukee and the mountains. The fence, as well as nearby buildings, were splattered with paint and decorated with roughly drawn roosters holding $500 bills. <laughs> In the end, the fence had its desired effect. In 1913, the Lee family sold their property to plant for $4,000 and moved away from their ancestral home. After acquiring the land he wanted, Plant set about clearing the remnants of earlier occupants. He had buildings burn and built a dam to create Shannon Lake, flooding the location of the Horn homestead. He even attempted to remove the Lee family cemetery, which he called an eyesore. <laughs> of course, the sheriff halted this plan. Plant was ordered to return the stones he had moved and repair any damage he had caused, which he did and today the small cemetery still sits at the top of Oski Park Road, just across the way from Maple Lodge, one of Plant's gatehouses. Plant's altercation with the Lee family wasn't an isolated incident either. He was reported to be very demanding of the crew that worked on the construction of his estate, and he had a habit of chasing reporters off his land. In fact, in 1914, he was fined one cent and costs for allegedly feeding a reporter. <laughs> Plant, of course, appeals the case. Unfortunately, I don't know what the results of that appeal were. <laughs> but not all the press, press was bad. As early as January of 1912, the Granite State News published an article <laughs> titled Plant's Purpose, in which the author described Plant as a pleasant gentleman a stark departure from his usual, uh, how he was typically portrayed. The article described Plant's desire to keep himself busy by developing the farming and stock raising potential of the area with the help of other in industrious New England families. Counter to earlier claims of his land greed, the reporter gave voice to Plant's love of nature and his desire to protect it and enhance the region as a place of beauty. Based on what we know about Tom Plant, he can best be described, described as complex. He played hardball a lot of the time, um, but he also seems to have been very much concerned with the well-being of the people he employed, both at his shoe factory as well as at his home 
at the lockdown state. Clearly, Tom Plant was a bit of a polarizing figure in the community, but he certainly did become a fixture in the community. He was dubbed the Earl of Ossipee Park, and local newspapers kept <coughs> reporting on his seasonal travels and latest diversions. I think it's fair to say that he was a man who knew what he wanted and worked hard to achieve those goals, sometimes at the expense of others, and that didn't always make him popular. But setting aside all of the drama of acquiring his new property, Plant set in motion the construction of his great estate, which he called Lucknow. Over a period of 18 months in 1913 and 1914, over 1,000 people labored to engineer and build all of the property's features. This included the 16-room mansion, stable and six-bay garage, two gatehouses, a 100-foot glass greenhouse, an 18-hole golf course, a tennis court, a boathouse on Lake Winnipesaukee, a working farm, an earthen dam, which subsequently created the lake for swimming and fishing, and roughly 45 miles of carriage and bridle trails through the mountains. The arts and craft style mansion and buildings were designed by architect J. Williams Beale of Boston, who reportedly worked closely with Tom to design a home that reflected the global architectural traditions observed by the plants on their travels abroad. The towers were modeled after Norman castles, the half timbering is reminiscent of Swiss or German design, and the house originally featured a carved wooden bridge pole modeled after that of a Japanese temple. The construction and amenities were cutting edge for 1914. Steel beams, Poured concrete and terracotta architectural blocks formed the base of this home. These materials were virtually unheard of in domestic construction at the time, but they came together here to create a sturdy and fire resistant mansion. The interiors were finished with wire lath and gypsum plaster for an additional layer of fire protection. The house was outfitted with technologies that were state-of-the-art at the turn of the 20th century. A central <coughs> vacuum, an ammonia brine refrigeration system, and a housewide interphone system, to name a few. Not to mention that the home was electrified from the very beginning. This mansion, high up on a hill overlooking the town of Moultonboro, had electricity for seven years before the rest of the town. <laughs> it was produced by a hydropower generator for the first seven years that the plants resided at Lucknow until electricity came to Moultonboro in 1921. Despite these modern touches, Beale and the plants designed Lucknow to harmonize with its surroundings using natural and often local materials, which created a rustic, handcrafted, handcrafted look that fit well into the arts and crafts aesthetic. As you might imagine, an estate of this magnitude would have had quite a lot of staff members to keep things running smoothly. In the early days, there were reportedly a staff of around 30 people working on the property. Maids, a cook, gardeners, stable hands, and a chauffeur, just to name the most obvious. Some of these individuals lived in the servant bedrooms in the mansion. Others lived in the property's two gatehouses, Brook and Maple Lodge and still others lived in dormitory-style housing in the stable or in the apartments on the plant farm, which we know today as Ledgewood Farm. <coughs> We're still learning about the people that worked on the Lucknow estate, and we certainly haven't accounted for everyone Tom Plant employed, but we do know of a few. Martina Momquist, for instance, who was a Swedish housekeeper who resided at Lucknow in the early 1930s. Leander Pinn of Meredith, who was one of the first uh, chauffeurs on the estate, and Moultonboro's own Russell and Chester Moulton, as well as Chester's wife, Agnes. It's here in the story that we see how Tom Plant really cared for his staff. He built a home outfitted with the latest technologies to make the work of his domestic staff as easy and efficient as possible. He provided comfortable accommodations with heaters tied into the home's central heating system, indoor bathing facilities, and large windows overlooking the lake and mountains. I do think that the plants 
did their very best to create a comfortable living and working environment for the staff of people who made their lives comfortable. But in any event, once construction was finished in 1914, Plant took up residence at Lucknow with his new bride, Olive Dewey Plant. Tom and Olive had met aboard a ship making the Atlantic crossing to Europe in the fall of 1912. They went their separate, separate ways, and in reality, Tom and Caroline's divorce was not yet finalized at that point. But Tom and Olive reconnected once back in the States and were married in the spring of 1913. Olive was a well-educated young woman. Before meeting Plant, she had studied Greek at Wellesley College and worked as both a school teacher and a bank teller. The Plants never had children, but their life at Lucknow wasn't quiet. The couple enjoyed the many outdoor activities that Lucknow had to offer. They played golf, tennis, they hiked and swam. They rode their prized horses through the mountains. They went boating, and the land was rife with wildlife for watching or hunting. In the winter, they skied, skated, and one year at least, built a top toboggan run for sledding. Olive particularly enjoyed superintending the large greenhouse and gardens on the property. And they entertained close friends and family and threw themselves into charitable and investment projects. In fact, as you may know, Plant was responsible for the development of the Bald Peak Colony Club. His aim for the club was to create a local community of peers, assuming that like-minded men and their families would flock to the area. Unfortunately, Plant reportedly placed too many restrictions on potential members, and he struggled to recoup his investment. This, in conjunction to overspending and a few other poor investments, you may have heard about the Russian bonds he purchased just before the Bolshevik Revolution. <laughs> this all resulted in financial difficulty for the Plants starting in the 1920s. They attempted to sell Lucknow without success. In 1930, Plant mortgaged Lucknow and several smaller tracts of land to a friend named Joseph Emery of Parsonfield, Maine. Under the terms of this mortgage, the estate included the land, buildings and improvements, equipment, and all contents within the buildings, furnishings, furniture, and personal property. Emery, however, allowed the plants to continue to reside at their mountaintop home. In March of 1941, <coughs> Emery passed away. At that time, the executors of his will realized that the plants had defaulted on certain terms of the mortgage, and they decided to foreclose upon it. Three months later, Plant himself passed away. And as the story goes, after escorting Tom's remains to Bath, Maine for burial, Olive returned to Lucknow to find the doors locked. She was able to get inside to collect her personal items, clothing, her china, and a few books, before returning to her family in Illinois. She eventually retired to California to be near her brother and lived a quiet life comfortably until she passed away in 1976 at the age of 93. So Tom and Olive lived on their Lucknow estate for about 27 years, enjoying all that it had to offer. But what happened in the years after Mr. Plant's death? The land and buildings were sold in June of 1942. Fred Toby purchased the property, buildings, and their contents from the executors of Joseph Emery's will for the sum of one dollar and other valuable considerations. <laughs> this is how Lucknow became the summer home of the Toby family of Plymouth, New Hampshire. Fred C. Toby was a real estate developer and lumber tycoon. His purchase of the property which included timber rights, was likely as much of a business investment as it was an opportunity to create a retreat for his family. The Toby family, including Fred and his wife Susan, their seven adult children and numerous grandchildren, summered at the mountaintop estate for 15 years. Members of the family who have visited the castle in recent years reminisced on nights spent in the guest rooms or the gatehouses 
calling each other on the housewide interphone system, working together on puzzles in the library, and playing with the bearskin rugs that once adorned the main hall, much to Mrs. Toby's horror. <laughs> By all accounts, the Toby family seemed to have enjoyed their summers exploring the property and reveling in the magic and majesty of the Lucknow Mansion and its natural vista. <coughs> In an interview conducted in the 1990s, Elizabeth Toby Gonerman attested that her mother, Susan, was the heart of Lucknow during their time on the estate. Like all of before her, Susan could often be found in her greenhouse, tending to the flowers, or relaxing on the window seat in the library. Susan adored the property so much that she allegedly refused to lend the estate to President Eisenhower as a summer retreat. Preferring to keep it for her family's use. <laughs> in the same interview, Libby explained that Susan became gravely ill, and in 1956, Fred sold Lucknow, believing that they would not be back to enjoy it as a family again. Happily, Susan recovered, but by that time, <coughs> Lucknow had become the property of Richard S. Roby. <coughs> Mr. Roby was considered a pioneer in the car and truck rental industry. He had been the largest Hertz licensee in the country and expanded Avis Rent-A-Car around the globe. It is not clear what inspired him to purchase Lucknow, although descendants remember Mrs. Roby telling the story of how her husband simply saw the estate and knew that there had to be a way to share it with the public. And in 1959, that's just what he did. Roby opened Lucknow to the public bearing a new name, Castle in the Clouds. Visitors were invited to tour the mansion and stable, what we call the carriage house today. They were encouraged to hike, picnic, and enjoy ice cream on the property, and even take a burrow ride to Sunset Hill. In 1971, Roby converted the plant's horse stable to make space for a gift shop, kitchen, and snack bar. After Roby passed away in 1973, his sons, Richard Roby Jr. and Donald Roby, continued operations. Over the years, the family added a variety of attractions, including a petting zoo and a go-kart track for visitors to enjoy. They built a sugar house, a horse stable near Shannon Pond, and even operated a small campground on the site for some time. Guests rode in VW buses up to the mansion, and tours ranged from guided excursions to an audio tour piped in through a modern speaker system. When the Roby family decided <clears throat> to sell in 1991, Castle in the Clouds had already been a New Hampshire attraction for over three decades. The new owners, the Castle Acquisition <coughs> Partnership, including millionaire investor J. Paul Stick, wanted to see the castle thrive, but they too had plans for expansion. In fact, the partnership's primary, <clears throat> primary interest was in developing Castle Springs bottled water, which began production in 1992. In 1995, the company added the Lucknow Brewery. Visitors <coughs> to Castle in the Clouds during those years were treated to tours of the bottling plant and spring site and the brewery, in addition to the historic mansion. In 2000, Sticht, who was already in his 80s and had had a long, successful career, was ready to divest himself of Castle Springs. When the time came to sell, the property was split. A Canadian company, <coughs> CG Roxanne, purchased the bottling plant, but that left nearly 5,500 acres of Tom Plant's original estate open to development. In 2001, the board of the Lakes Region Conservation Trust began a serious conversation about purchasing Castle in the Clouds and its surrounding acreage for $5.9 million. Mm -hmm. What followed was a Herculean fundraising effort that resulted in LRCT finalizing the purchase of the property in 2003. After operating the castle for two seasons, they came to the conclusion that they needed some assistance in managing the historic building. LRCT explored a number of options, including the possibility of selling, leasing, or donating a portion of the historic estate to another nonprofit. 
and they eventually determined that the best course of action was for a handful of the board members who were particularly interested in these historic structures to branch off and form a new society, the Castle Preservation Society, which would take on the responsibility of restoring and preserving the plant's home and their legacy. In 2006, the Castle Preservation Society, CPS, was officially formed as a 501c3 nonprofit organization. CPS immediately took over management of the day-to-day -day operations of Castle and the Plants. And in 2010, LRCT transferred title to the historic buildings and the surrounding 135 acres to CPS. The two organizations continue to work in partnership to ensure that the land and buildings of Lucknow and the Oxford Mountain Park remain a natural and cultural resource for the public. Today we strive to preserve, interpret, and share this amazing house and property with our visitors. In 2018, we were, we were added to the National Register of Historic Places. If you come to visit us this season, you will see nearly two decades worth of progress towards restoring the mansion to its original condition. So now that you know a little bit more about the backstory, the history of our property, I invite you to stop by this season to see it all for yourself in person. Come for a few hours or make a day of it. Hike the trails, still maintained by LRCT, and enjoy the property the way B.F. Shaw's guests did over a hundred years ago. Tour the mansion and imagine what it must have been like to wake up in such an incredible place to such an incredible view. This is a very special house and property that I, for one, love talking about. So please come be my guest and explore the land of love now. Thank you. And I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Do you, um, people can't stay there overnight. No, no not overnight. It almost sounded like that was part of Oh. <laughs> And the no, restaurant is still there? The restaurant is oh, still yeah. there, yes. We <laughs> serve lunch Thursday through Sunday. Thank you. Thank you. And we had a radon test at the house. <laughs> radon. Radon. Um, off the top of my head, I am not aware. <laughs> I'm sure that's something that they did prior to us yeah. reopening. <laughs> All right, is the, the bottling operation still there? Uh, the bottling plant is still there. It's owned by CG Roxanne. They produce That's crystal right. geyser water. Right, right, yep. right, right. In the way back. I was wondering how the trustees ever got away with selling that property for $1. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's the other valuable considerations that is where the, the real price is. Um, that's something that they say in um, deeds from that time to get around telling you how much somebody actually paid for it. Yeah. <laughs> I would want to go back to the hotel that was originally built. Mm -hmm. uh, I got a little confused in the history of what happened to that. So that was one of the buildings that Tom Clant burned down when he was constructing his estate. He actually used it for housing for construction workers until his mansion was complete, um, at which point they burned the building. And that was the original owner of the properties. Yes, that was the house Shaw's. and then guest house. And yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. And that actually was situated right in the meadow across from Shannon Pond. So that would have been around 1920. The that it would have burned in 1914. 14, yeah. Shaw had a lot of money. He built it for himself. Why did he decide to take his board? It's really unclear, other than the fact that they were already inviting guests up to spend the summer with them. So perhaps they saw an opportunity to share it with an even wider audience. I think they were just social and they wanted company. Yeah, I mean, potentially. No children, so they probably wanted people around. Well, Shaw, Shaw had children. Oh, okay. Yes. So, um, and it was actually his daughter that ended up continuing to operate the hotel after right. he yeah. passed away. So that was one of his four 
investments. Um, mm -hmm. it, it was great in theory. Uh, it just he couldn't sell enough of the cottages to make back what he had wanted. Um, so it became a functioning golf club, obviously. It still is today. Um, over the years, as Tom Plant individually lost funds, the club was doing fine. And eventually he just, he broke away from that. It became a separate entity entirely. Um, and they're still thriving. <laughs> I would love to go in there and take a peek at all of the historic buildings. Yeah. <laughs> Is there always something? <laughs> <laughs> if I knew it one, I probably shouldn't tell. <laughs> you can play charity golf. Oh, 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 so you know there are whole events that are held there. Oh. Okay. Oh. Just another note, we do have passes here at the library, so if you uh, have a library card, um, we do have passes for Kathy and the child, there's a one for an adult, one for each child, and then the second adult is 50% off any um, of the child is 50% off. So we have the passes here that you can um, reserve if you want to go check it out at the end there. Is your evening music and dinner on the patio program uh, has become so popular <laughs> it really has, that it's yes. <laughs> almost impossible to do, and it's become expensive as well. Are there any options for expanding the number of days you do that, or Not making currently. it easier, or lunches like that? Or we like are that? really restricted by staffing shortages right now. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we yeah. are yeah. doing the best we can yeah. to uh, have the restaurant open at all. Um, that's why we are only offering lunch from Thursday to Sunday this year. Our music nights are Monday and Tuesday by reservation. Um, as we are able to hire more staff, we really do hope to expand that because we love being able to share that yeah. with our visitors as well. Okay, thank you so much, Robin. This was excellent. Thank you.